The Canadian Kilties was a unique organization consisting of 40 artists who wear the Highland costume but who play the music of all nations with a spirit and understanding that speaks volumes for their individual and collective ability as musicians. With the band is a trained choir of 16 voices headed by Mr. J. Coates Lockhart, Canada's eminent tenor. And with the Clan Johnstone troupe of pipers and dancers, also there is Bert Daniels, cornet virtuoso, and Mr. E. R. Clark, trombone soloist. And of course we cannot forget Donald McCormick, the giant drum major who stands over seven feet tall. It's the greatest band from Belleville, Ontario. You never knew. The Kilties Touring Band, from 1902 to 1933, also known as the Regimental Band of the Gordon Highlanders, was formed in Toronto by members of the 48 Highlanders Band. The Kilties Band of Belleville, Ontario was one of Canada's most popular international touring bands of its day. Now when Thomas P.J. Power, owner of the Queen's Hotel in Belleville first conceived the idea of forming a local band in 1900, he probably never expected the group's meteoric rise to world fame to happen, and only within a few years. Thomas Power and William Robertson were its first bandmasters, and its membership at times included coronetist Mr. Voss and pipe sergeant David Ferguson. Playing at parks and touring on the vaudeville circuit, they eventually came to perform in 20 countries, including appearing at the St. Louis World Fair in 1904 and giving two Royal Command performances in Britain. Then from 1908 to 1910, they went around the world and in 1915 played to great acclaim at the Panama San Diego Exposition. But for the most part, they are not well remembered. So join me in learning about the Kilties. As for their costume, it is Canadian and it is Scotch. Canada has adopted the kilt, and all of our seven fortresses are manned by the men in kilts. As for the quality of the band, well, four times it was commanded to appear at the court of His Majesty King Edward. And if you want to see Scotch piping and dancing, you must see Albert Johnston of Dundee, Scotland, who is the champion piper of the world. And the Johnstone troupe of dancers, of course. Now, Albert Johnson was born February 16, 1864, in Lochie, Dundee, Scotland. His father, George, was a blacksmith. Albert won many prizes for piping and dancing and competed alongside some of the top players of his time. Albert continued his good competitive record around Scotland's Highland Games in the piping and dancing events. And in March 1891, there was a newspaper report on his dancing prowess where at the Dundee Highland Ball, he executed the Sean Truce in his usual faultless manner. Now, this dance is considered to be the classic dance of all Highland solos and is said to be the expression of the national grief at the banning of the kilt following the last battle of Colondon, which ended the rebellion in support of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Albert was soon asked to tour with his best dancers. They called themselves simply enough, the Johnstone Troop. After their successes in London, the troop toured North America, where they came to the attention of Thomas P.J. Power, a hotel owner in Belleville, Ontario. 
The group eventually went on to become the Belleville Kilties and the Clan Johnstone Troop, who had agreed to join the band. The Kilties' recording of the Maple Leaf Forever in 1902 for Berliner was the first musical recording by an ensemble in Canada. Their recordings included selections from Robert Bruce and a popular march, Soldiers of the Queen. Their distinctive record label was emblazoned with a colorful plaid and black lettering. Thousands of glowing newspaper reports from around the world would appear over the next few years. Power and members of his band found themselves at the center of attention and adulation from local residents celebrating the imminent departure of the band on its first of its 16 tours across the world that took place between 1904 and 1930. Work was shut down for the day and area residents flocked to the city's downtown area to watch the band pass by in a parade organized by the city's officials to formally mark its departure for the tour. The world tour of the Belleville Kilties, later widely known as Canada's greatest concert band, would take its members nearly half a million miles across 20 countries, spending 110 days crossing oceans, performing in the largest coliseums, music halls and theaters. Wherever they went, large and enthusiastic audiences greeted them. The band's popularity soared. Branded by the press and the public as one of the world's greatest concert organizations. Power and his Kilties undertook their first tour of the British Isles in 1904. One of their first engagements on this tour would be at Balmoral Castle, where the Kilties played for King Edward VII. This reputation earned them many more opportunities to perform in front of other royalties of the world as the tour progressed. The Kilties composed of 40 members who wore striking kilts and featured a trained choir of 16 voices, as well, of course, as the Albert Johnstone dancing and piping specialists. The famous Scotch-Canadian band was led by two giant drum majors, each well over seven feet in height. Sergeant Major Roderick Bain Mackenzie, one of the two giant drum majors, described as a fine specimen of perfectly proportioned manhood, standing seven foot one inches in his socks and weighing 322 pounds. He is 33 years of age and comes from Scottish stock. His father was born in Loch Cairn, Scotland, and he was 7 foot 11 inches in height. And his mother, who belongs to the Black Macrae clan of Kintail and is a native of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, can boast a stature of 6 foot 1 inches herself. Mackenzie, who first saw the light at Lucknow, Ontario in 1877, has served the British Army and still belongs to the reserves. He enlisted in Canada in the 2nd Battalion of Gordon's Highlanders and was stationed with his regiment in Scotland, India and elsewhere. And during the Boer War, he fought in Natal under General Bluel and subsequently under General Enid Hamilton at the British defeat on Spiankop, where he was in the thick of the fight. He carries several mementos in the shape of bullet wounds 
And at the conclusion of the war, he met the Kilties band at the St. Louis World's Fair, and he joined them. I am not the giant of the Kilties band, he would say, as Donald McCormick, the other drum major, who is recognized as one of Canada's best oarsmen, and can give me an inch in height. The first tour occupied no fewer than 40 weeks, the troop covering altogether 35,000 miles and performing at all the principal cities in every state. It was the longest and most successful band tour ever made in America. Another tour of America was opened at Buffalo, and the troop danced before thousands of enthusiastic admirers in the Grand Exposition Hall at the St. Louis Exposition. They had a warm reception from almost every Scottish clan society in Canada and America. They danced before millionaires, shaken hands with senators of America, and had praise showered on them by every class. Now dancing at all times is hot work, but Pipe Major Johnston and his troop had one occasion to be thankful for this fact. In Winnipeg, they gave a performance when the thermometer stood at 40 degrees below zero. The dancers warmed to their work, but the frost attacked the piper's ear, and he felt more inclined to dance the Highland Fling than nurse the Philabag, which is the modern version of the short kilt. In the mining camps, they had the lowest charge. In some cases, it was two dollars for admission. The piping and dancing raised whoops of delight from patriotic Scotsmen. At Galveston, Sissy Grant, the principal dancer of the troupe, had a huge bouquet presented to her. And on another occasion, the pipe major received a tribute consisting of a bunch of Scotland's national emblem, the thistle. In every hole and corner in Canada and the States, I met Dundee men, all of whom were in good circumstance. One of them came up to us when we were performing in the wooden shanty at Brisby Mining Camp, Arizona, and presented Sissy with a souvenir in the shape of a good pin, the head being a small gold nugget found in Denver, Colorado. During that first British tour in 1904, the Kilties played for King Edward VII at Balmoral Castle, and a newspaper reporter in Dundee asked about the experience. Ah, uh, yes, the King was certainly pleased. I piped and danced for Queen Victoria many a time. How she did love the piping and the dancing. The King at Balmoral is naturally regarded by the troupe as the highest honor they have ever received or can ever expect to receive. The ballroom in which they performed was tastefully draped with the tartan, and the members of the royal family who witnessed the performance were all attired in Highland dress. It was like carrying coals to Newcastle to take me to Balmoral to play the pipes for His Majesty, but the royal audience seemed to be thoroughly appreciated of the march, the Strasbay and the reel I rendered, and then Tom performed the sword dance. The king expressed his delight by shouting, Bravo! And when the Irish jig was danced by the troop in the costume of the Colleens and the Patties at the Irish County Fair, the king was so much impressed that he kept time with his hands and feet, and some appreciative remarks passed between his majesty and the Prince of Wales. The tour of the Kilties comprised of many towns in England, Scotland and Ireland, and afterwards they journeyed to Paris. 
and on returning to the States, the troops contemplated a tour in Australia. So in 1908, the Belleville-based band embarked on a bold tour of the earth, performing more than a thousand concerts, covering 112,000 kilometers, and spending $60,000 on transportation. The group started their round-the-world tour in Belleville, where their manager, Thomas Power, lived. After all, he was the proprietor of the new Queen's Hotel on Front Street, just opposite the City Hall. After performing more than 50 shows across Canada, the troupe took to the high seas on the SS Merrimar in Victoria, BC, and headed west across the Pacific Ocean. Their trip took them to Hawaii, Fiji, Australia, New Zealand, Sri Lanka, India, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Italy, France, Gibraltar, and of course Scotland and England. One of the group compiled an album of photographs taken on the journey. Despite their punishing concert schedule, the Kilties found plenty of time to play the part of the tourist, and the album faithfully records many of the places they visited, including the Taj Mahal in India. The Kilties World Tour was the most remarkable tour ever accomplished by any musical organization in the world. During the touring years, the Kilties visited France, Australia, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and all the other places that I've already mentioned, including Hawaii and Mexico. Some tours took as long as two years before the group even returned to Belleville. Power, the man who owned the Kilties, was considered one of the ablest business managers in the amusement business on the American continent. The souvenir album commemorating their fateful, successful world tour was sold for a few cents before and after each performance. At the Crystal Palace in London, the attendance was 170,000 paid admissions on that day. At Willow Grove Park, Philadelphia, the attendance reached 150,000 in one day. Now at Madison Square Gardens, New York, the receipts for one day reached $7,000. While at the Coliseum in Chicago, the receipts were well over 4,000 for one day. In Sydney, Australia, the town hall that seated over 6,000 people was sold out solid for two weeks at very high prices. The band was also the only one to have had the honor to be invited to play all of its concerts in the Million Dollar Festival Hall during the World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri before a paying audience. All the other bands, representing other countries of the world, played free of charge in the open. Albert Johnson and the Kilties visited Honolulu and Hawaii, arriving on July 24, 1908. A newspaper reports describe Albert as the most famous piper in Scotland. The band paraded from the ship to the opera house for their two performances, and the next day departed for Australia. The band was in Britain again before it returned to the U.S. in 1910, sailing from Southampton on the RMS Teutonic and arriving in New York in July. They played to great acclaim at the Panama, California Exposition in 1915. Some of the men who headed the band in the years of its active career included William T. Robinson, who, for his musical achievements, 
with the band received a diamond-studded ivory baton from King Edward VII. Next came William Peel, followed by Albert Cook, who held office with the Kilties for seven years, the longest among all of its conductors. Ah, but I'm sure you never knew all that. Local history is such a wonderful thing if you give it a chance. Now the Kilties' run eventually ended and the members drifted apart, some going to other great accomplishments and some to a regular life filled with the memories of when they were the kings of the world. They had reunions from time to time to reminisce, but all have passed into that other place where we all must go eventually. In 1921 census of Canada, Albert Johnstone, now 57, and Mary Jane, his wife, 42, their daughter, Kitty, 14, and Mary Jane's brother, William, 28, lived at 74 Dundas Street, Hastings West, in Belleville. By now, they had all retired from the entertainment business. Albert and Mary Jane's occupation is listed in the census as teacher, and her brother, William, as a piano tuner. But alas, Albert died on April 21st, 1938, and was buried in the Belleville Cemetery. His occupation at the time of his death was stated as proprietor of amusement hall. Ah, so let's all remember the Kilties Band of Belleville, the once greatest band in the world. <laughs> 